Hey guys, what's up? And welcome to my video tutorial on how you can get a better moon image with minimal equipment. My name is Stephen Doy. I'm from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. And in this video, I'm going to show you how you can get a nice, crisp, sharp moon image, professional looking image. Now, it is going to require some things here. You're going to need an SLR camera, some kind of zoom like lens whether it be a telescope or a telephoto lens or a zoom lens, a tripod, a remote shutter, a Windows computer, Windows operating system computer, and uh, a little bit of computer knowledge. Um, if you don't have any of those things, well, move on to the next tutorial because you're going to waste an hour and a half of watching this. So I'm going to be showing you how to get a better moon image. So here I got an image off the internet, just Google searched it. Somebody's half moon. This is what most people are getting. This is what I usually see posted on weather network and stuff like that. And it's a noisy image, not really that crisp or sharp. And most people do this and just be like, how, why, why am I not getting a sharp image? My camera is like a top of the line and it looks like crap. Or they'll take a full moon image, say. Full moon, most people, you're not going to get contrast on a full moon image. A lot of people like to photograph a full moon image, but this is what they're getting, and they're just, this is crap. Why? How come? Right? <laughs> so I'm going to show you in this video the proper technique and everything on how to do it. Here is just a single exposure what I've got. So basically, if I went out with my SLR camera, which I did, and I took a picture of the moon here. This is a 600 mil lens that I used. And of course, it's been cropped off. And this is what I got. Looks like crap. Blurry. I haven't really sharpened it in Photoshop or anything yet. But when you sharpen, you're going to get noise right away. Here's a full moon image that I did. And again, blurry. Doesn't look that great. Very flat. Well, if you follow along in this tutorial, I'm going to show you how you can take your image like this and get something like that. So this image was actually used in making of this one. So if you want to learn how you can get a nice moon image like this, crisp moon image, follow along in this tutorial and I'm guarantee you, you will get a better moon shot if you do this technique. Um, it is a little bit of a long tutorial, I'm sorry. It's an hour and a half long. I went very in depth on it. And uh, so I'm including in the description the timestamps for each chapter. So you can just skip ahead and go to the parts that you want to know and uh, skip the parts that you don't want to know. So good luck to you. Hopefully you'll be getting better moon shots. And uh, yeah, let's get started. Okay, so before we begin, I want to just do a little bit of explaining on astrophotography and maybe go over some equipment here. Uh, first thing I want to make very clear, and I really wish I would have learned this when I started the hobby, it would have made the learning curve so much easier. And that is, there's two different types of astrophotography. And by types, I mean techniques as to how you process your data and uh, how you collect your data. So the first type of astrophotography is what we're going to be doing throughout this tutorial which is considered planetary astrophotography. It is actually done with video and um, the whole reason you want to use video is due to atmospheric disturbance. But in our situation that I'm doing in this tutorial is most people don't have this type of equipment. So I've going to demonstrate a cheat where we can actually use our SLR camera, take images, make those images into a video, and process them the proper technique. So with video, the whole reason we got to do this and go through all this BS, <laughs> it seems like a lot, a lot of work, and honestly it is, but once you do a few images and once you have the software, you'll learn to just fly through it. 
But here's some raw data I used with my dedicated camera collecting on Jupiter. And you can see how it bounces around and goes blurry and clear. This is the atmospheric disturbance that we're trying to get through. And this is why we got to use video. Trying to just get a shot like this with an SLR camera, it you're going to end up getting the blurry shot 90% of the time. Uh, Jupiter really isn't a good example because nobody ever uses an SLR to shoot Jupiter. But it does show the atmospheric disturbance. That's why I use that video. Here's a crescent moon. And you can see like how it's as if it's being held up over a fire. And it's exactly what it is. It's just disturbance, turbulence in the atmosphere. And so if you just take a single exposure, I'll just pause it here. You'll get some sharp points here, sharp points here, and oh, it's all blurry down here, and blurry down here. So I'll take like a bunch of exposures, and we're going to put them together into a video. And using the software, the software is going to take every frame in this video, or every image that we're taking, and it's going to find all the sharp points here and use them, and all the sharp points here and use them, and all the sharp points here, and it goes over the entire surface and uh, it'll give you a final nice crisp image. Another advantage to use in video is when you get those fluke shots of say an airplane flying in front of the moon. With a camera you get maybe one good shot. With a video camera I got maybe 30 to 60 shots with this one. And so what I did is I finished imaging the bottom portion of the crescent moon. I sharpened, did my image of the crescent moon. There is it. So I'll bring it up here. So I did my crescent moon by processing the way I will be de demonstrating here. And then I used the software and pulled that one frame that had the airplane right about here, lined it up with everything else on the image and blended it in and I got my final composite image. Right here is just a single frame shot with an SLR camera and a telephoto lens. And you can see sure sharp points here, a little bit blurry here. Honestly, it just looks like crap. Just a single exposure. But with this, I took about 100 of these images and I stacked them together and then I zoomed out and got a wide angle of the clouds that were just rolling in around the moon like this and then I blended them together in Photoshop to get this image and as you can see look how much more sharper that moon image turned out by stacking the frames and also I shrinked it down. It's the nice thing about a telephoto lens so I was zoomed in the moon was actually this big and then I zoomed back out I resize the moon to fit into there and you actually get even more resolution. This one here was also done using the DSLR technique that I'll be de demonstrating to get a nice crisp moon image. This was actually way back a long time ago before I learned how to actually reduce noise apparently. <laughs> it's not that great of an image, wow. But it does look kind of cool. It was the blue moon, so I made it blue. So that is planetary imaging. Jupiter, Venus, Mars, Saturn, Sun, Moon, anything that's bright and takes a fast exposure is considered planetary astrophotography. The other type is called DSO imaging, which stands for deep sky object. And uh, with deep sky object, it requires taking a bunch of exposures, again, but it's not going to be video, it'll be just raw images. So like this here, this is a five minute exposure of the Orion Nebula. In order to watch this place of the sky for five minutes and not get these stars trailing, you obviously need a nice, nice mount in order to track the sky. And that's where the mounts come into play. So you take your five minute exposure, take another five minute, take another five minute, and just continue taking the exposures. So these two techniques they're kind of the same but they are different. One uses video because they're just fast exposures and the atmosphere disturbs it. Whereas DSO they're very faint objects you don't really see that atmospheric disturbance 
and you just do long exposures. So after you get all your exposures, you run it through a totally different processing, processing software, and you'll get your final image once it's stacked together and pro final processed through like Photoshop, whatever, of the Orion Nebula. You get way more detail, you get a lot more gases pop out. This here is the Andromeda Galaxy, and this I was doing 20 minute exposures, so I was tracking very precisely, and I just kept doing 20 minute exposures multiple nights, and then with the whole processing te technique here, you keep stacking those images together and it averages them together, and then that actually adds up to the length of said exposure. So if I did two 20 minute exposures, blend them together, I actually have one 40 minute exposure. Whereas this is a crap load of 20 minute exposures that add up to 6 hours worth of exposure time. If you are in the city, uh, narrowband is another option. And uh, even out of the city, narrowband is it's an amazing way of getting nice pictures for emission nebulas only. And that is nebulas that are emitting light at a specific wavelength. It's so like this image here, I use three different filters, which are considered the Hubble palette. And I blended them into separate channels to get a final image. So red is hydrogen. It's hydrogen that's being excited by the stars in this birth region. And uh, yellow is sulfur, or green is sulfur, and blue is oxygen. And I blend them to three different channels, and that's what you get. Pretty wild looking pictures. So, just give me one sec here. So, what we'll be using is an SLR camera with a telephoto lens like this. Uh, some people, they've actually modified webcams with uh, like an old film canister. This isn't a film canister, this is actually a fitting that you can get for this type of webcam. And it allows you to actually put it into a telescope and record video with that. Uh, this here is an actual dedicated CCD, dedicated camera, planetary camera, mind you. There's two different types of cameras, keep that in mind. A DSO camera, which is a CCD, they're both CCDs, but this one does video. The other one will actually do long exposures and different size chips. So that's all it is, it's just a little chip that records video stick that in your telescope, record your video, and then bring it in and process it through this way. So if you do have a telescope and you're recording video, you can still follow along throughout this tutorial. Um, this is the proper planetary processing, processing, processing technique is with video. And if you are capturing video, I'd highly recommend Fire Capture. Uh, you can just type in Fire Capture on Google, you'll find it. It's free software and uh, it's great for collecting your data in order to process. So in this video, I'm going to be demonstrating on how I do this with just a DSLR camera. So I've taken a bunch of exposures of the moon. They all look the same, but actually they are all slightly different. They have different sharp points on them and different blurry points on them. <laughs> So I took all those videos, or all those photos, sorry, and I'm gonna I run them through PIP, and uh, PIP stands for Planetary Imaging Image Processing Pre-processing, something like that. But you run it through that, it aligns everything very nicely, and it'll spit it out as a video if you want. So this is a video of all the frames that I just took, and you can actually well, I don't know if it'll show up but this is all clear over here and it goes blurry at a certain point too so after I took that video I ran it through this pro program here auto stacker and uh, it stacked the images I picked out how the percentage of images I wanted it to spit out Bear with me here. Wrong software. <laughs> Always does that. Radio. 
And uh, this, I had it spit out just a sharpened image, just so you can see what you get when you stack your images. Much nicer. A little bit more noise, but much sharper. It's crisp and sharp across the entire surface. None of this blurry over here. And so this is what I'll be demonstrating on how to do. But normally, I will run my... Uh, data through these programs and uh, I'll take it into Photoshop afterwards and then do my final processes, processing. So this is considered pre-processes. This is a really hard word to say. <laughs> say that one ten times fast. But normally I'll just have it spit out an unsharpened image like this. So this is ran through AutoStacker without the sharpening algorithm and it actually still looks pretty nice but you, it gives you more leeway to sharpen and I'd rather sharpen using Photoshop. I have better luck using that. So I'll just have it spit this out and then I'll take it in and process it that way. Uh, Registax, it's actually good if you don't have a final process processing <laughs> software like Photoshop. Registax actually gives you more leeway on your sharpening and where you want to sharpen and more adjustments basically than AutoStacker does. But uh, I'm going to warn you, these programs are very unstable and uh, they do like to crash, especially if you overload them. So like uh, with Registax, you can actually run just images through this program but it will tend to crash. Whereas if we convert it to video and actually crop off all that black, extra black area, it helps it out to be able to process your image. Okay, so here we are, set up, ready to shoot the moon with our basic setup. I'm using my Sigma 150 to 600 mil lens and then your entry level DSLR uh, Canon T4i. So to begin with obviously you're going to want to be zoomed in as far as possible. So here we are 600 mil. If your cam camera has image stabilization I would suggest using it to get your focus and then shut it off. And as for autofocus you can use it to set uh, focusing on the moon but I find manual focus you'll get a better effect and I'll show you how I do it here. So I'll just go on here, flip myself over to manual focus and I have my image stabilization turned on. If your camera doesn't have it don't worry about it it just makes it a little bit easier to do the manual focusing. And so I'll just spin my camera around here, flick it on and I'm going to find the moon, set it up, and show you pretty much how I do this. Okay, so I found the moon, centered it the best I can get for now. Uh, the way I found it, this is awesome with the benefit of live view. It's pretty simple to find, it's nice and bright. So, I want it slightly centered. It's going to be traveling from left to right constantly so you'll have to find you constantly have to readjust and try to center it but uh, try to keep it away from the edges because later on in processing when we try to align all these frames they are uh, not going to work if they're too close to the edge so try to stay around in the middle and uh, so we'll go to my settings here full manual you want your ISO you can go down to about ISO 400 reduces the amount of noise in the image usually where I sit it at. As for my f-stop, the moon is fairly bright. f11 seems to be where my camera likes it. It's a sweet spot where I can actually get a nice sharp focus. And then as for your shutter speed, uh, if you have live view, go into live view and you can actually adjust your shutter speed to get exactly what you want, like the without overexposing it or underexposing it. But first we need to get in focus, so I shoot start with usually around a shutter speed of 1 400th. 
Uh, it all depends on your camera, the phase of the moon, sky conditions. So we'll go with that. And then now I'm going to loosen off my clutches on my mount. Bring it slightly centered. And this is why I wanted the image stabilization still on. We're going to zoom in digitally using the live view on Canon's. And if I half press, like you see how it just jiggles every time I touch it? If you half press, your image stabilization will actually take that jitter out. And it's a lot easier for you to focus. So now what I do, try to get around here, is I'll half press my shutter and adjust my focus at the same time. There we go. And I'll focus past it, past it again, and I just teeter back my focus back and forth, and then get less and less each time until I find that sweet spot. Which seems to be about there. Move to a more contrasty area. That looks pretty good. I'll actually adjust my shutter speed so I can see in that darker region than the moons moon sorry where you can actually see some contrast and again half press shutter it takes a little bit of guess getting used to down you can do just like a straight autofocus but I find you get better results doing it manually That looks pretty good there. And you can see how it goes blurry and then clear, blurry then clear. This is why we gotta take a bunch of exposures is the atmosphere disturbance will give us some crap pictures. So by taking a bunch of pictures and using software, we'll actually get a nice, sharp, professional looking image. So this actually looks pretty good to me. I think I'm gonna stick with that. And then as for figuring out my shutter speed, well, it's just a matter of adjusting the wheel here and what looks good to you. I'm going to go with 150th of a second. Seems to look all right. It's always good to zoom in, see if you're overexposing. That's the one thing you don't want is an overexposure because that is harder to save. Whereas under exposure with processing, you can actually save that stuff. Yeah, let's go with 320th. That looks better. This one crater here on the moon, it's usually a good spot to watch for your overexposure to go. It's like one of the brightest craters that always gets overexposed. Alright, one four hundredth, like I said, this is usually where I start and that's usually what I end up with. Alright, so now that we got that all centered, well not centered, focused, sorry, we can turn off our image stabilization because we don't want that while imaging on a tripod. It is freezing up here. <laughs> Alright. So now it's just a pretty much a matter of, again, centering it. Double check our settings now. Manual 1 400th, F11, ISO 400, burst mode. I tend to shoot in RAW. Shooting in RAW basically gives you the advantage of recovering highlights that are overexposed and shadows. Uh, if you want to shoot JPEG as a beginner, go for it. It works too. For really the moon, you probably can't get away with just doing it in JPEG. So I myself stick with RAW though. All right, so after everything's all set up, you want to use your remote shutter that I got set up on my camera here. And uh, wake up camera. 
I'm gonna press and hold the button and you'll hear it takes a burst of photos and then it slows right down let go let it load those photos onto the memory card so what's happening is it'll take a bunch of photos and it'll save it on the internal memory of the camera and then put it on the card if you got a cheap memory card this could take a while for each of them to load but uh, when you buy memory cards just look for the class and uh, class 10 is usually the best one I found so now that it's loaded take another burst and let it load again you can see I'm already starting to lose it so I'm going to recenter well it does the loading so turn on live view adjust across adjust down and go over a bit it's okay to be a little bit to the left that gives it time to travel across and then here we go take another burst you want to take a minimal of 40 images uh, it also depends on the sky conditions tonight it is crystal clear we have awesome seeing conditions and actually Jupiter is sitting right next to the moon so I'll take as many as I can um, 300 that's a little much well not really the more the better when you do it with video you want like thousands of frames but uh, with an SLR it does use up the uh, shutter count on it so it's up to you how many you want to take 40 is where you'll actually see some nice results so anywhere between 40 and 300 is usually good so that is pretty much it this is what is considered collecting data to us astrophotographers so we're gonna continue collecting this data and then take this inside and I'll show you how to take all these photos and process them into a really cool moonshot so here's a good example why it's kind of impossible to use an SLR to shoot stuff like Jupiter the smaller planets they're actually the bigger planets but they're uh, very distant from us so like Jupiter Mars Venus uh, since we had Jupiter right next to the moon there it is see that little tiny dot yeah you need high magnification a nice sturdy mount and again this is where you would want to actually use video and uh, process it the proper planetary astrophotography way we can actually do a digital zoom here on Jupiter so zoom in five times then ten times it is there you can actually see some color in it too and if you crank up your exposure other way this is where most people get amazed see those dots that's the moons of Jupiter even a simple pair of binoculars you can actually see the moons of Jupiter so I'll take some pictures bring them up on the computer show you what it does get but uh, it's nothing compared to what you can actually get with a telescope and uh, proper camera you see how fast that things traveling though across the sky that's another issue is uh, you need a quick shutter speed to stop that motion or a mount that actually follows it across the sky and there's actually all four moons there too See if I can just do a five times zoom. There we go. No, nope, wrong button. Damn it. My hand is turning numb. Yeah. Jupiter and its four Galilean moons. There's a little added bonus for you. Alright, in order to process all of our photos here, we're going to need this software. So, all this software is just totally free. You just got to know what it is and where to find it. So, we'll just go with Google search here. Use whatever internet you want. And uh, let's start with the first one that we'll be using, which is PIP. So, in all capitals, P I P P. Schmoogle search that and it'll come up as the first site here uh, sites.google.com sites astropip we'll go into here and you go pip downloads by the way this uh, website 
it has a full manual for the program if you want to really in depth on how to use it. Let's send it download up here 2.5.4 and we'll go download and that's going to save that into our downloads folder obviously. So we'll go back to Schmoogle here. The next one we'll be using it'll be Registax. R E no oh, wait. New no. R E G I S T A X Search and it'll be the first site astronomy.be front slash registax I should have clicked the little download tab but either way go download and with registax right now version 6 you gotta install the program and then you gotta install this update so it's version 6.1 and then you install the update 6.1.08 so we'll uh, download both of these into our downloads folder so when we install it we have to even do that uh, go to the program first and then the update and last but not least is auto stacker And again, Google search it. A U T O S T A K K E R T. Don't know where they get these names. And it'll be the first one here. Set the search, whatever. First one here, autostacker.com. Just click the downloads, it takes you quicker to it. And with AutoStacker, there should be an update, a beta version that's out. Yeah. So we'll go to here, beta version with changes, notes available here. It's uh, the newest version, and it's actually really good. I've had no issues with it so far. So we want the first one here, 2.6.1.4 is the beta version. If you do end up downloading this older version, they're pretty similar it's not much different and it's still as simple as what I show in this tutorial is one two three so we got all of our files downloaded here in our downloads folder so we can close internet and then we go into our file browser and we want to go to downloads and we'll install pip first so it comes as a zip file, just go ahead and open it. Your computer should find the program to use to extract the pip. Or extract the pip, sorry. Extract the zip file. And then just click exact, extract and OK. Basically all that is, it's a compressed file and you're just opening it up and taking the program out of there. So now that we have it unzipped, we can go ahead and install the program. So you double click on it you get a pop-up that's not showing up on the screen just say yes to it and then pretty much go ahead and agree to everything it asks and finished quick and simple just like that here's our shortcut there's the program and next one is going to be Registax so like I said there's the update and then the actual setup program so we'll do the setup program first you get the administrator pop-up, agree to it. So yeah, once you start up Registax install, just go ahead and next, next, I agree, next, next, and start. Takes up a whopping 8 megabytes on your hard drive. And we don't want to start it up yet. And next and exit and then now we'll install the update to that program so double click it and you'll get a administrator pop-up that you have to agree to 
it doesn't show up on the screen recording and then here we go the update next next I agree next and start and it's gonna probably boot it up right now for us there we go red stack six so these are like really small programs that doesn't take much hard drive space but they are very powerful programs for what they do for photos. So we'll close that, move our icon over here. And then last but not least is Auto Stacker. Again, it's a zip file, so just open it up. Your computer will find the program. You want to highlight everything and go Extract. Say OK. And I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> Whatever, it works. So we got the four files here Auto Stacker, Dead Pixels, EULA, and Sharpen Filter. So, what we want to do is take all these files. So, I'll hold Control, select all four of these files, and we're going to cut them. And we're going to save them somewhere on our hard drive where we're know it's going to be at because what it is is auto stacker runs on its own it doesn't use the windows program at all you can actually run auto stacker off a, a little disk a memory stick so I got a file in my documents folder under astro programs and I called it auto stacker and I'm going to paste all that in there so you can even just save it on your desktop if you really want just put it somewhere where you know where it's going to be and then you take your application icon the one with the picture right click and go send to desktop create shortcut and what that's going to do is give me a shortcut to be able to boot up the program right from my desktop so here that is too so if you ever do forget where you put that as long as you have this shortcut you can always go right click open file location and then it shows uh, here it's in this PC documents Astro programs auto stacker so there's auto stacker there's registax and there's pip and there's our images so okay so let's say you want to remove this software uh, for those of you that actually already know how to install and remove software feel free to skip on to the next chapter those of you that don't know this well follow along so to remove the software it's pretty much straightforward for just about every piece of software is you need to get into your control panel if you don't know how to get to it you could always just do a search so if you're using older Windows, you'd have your search bar down here at the bottom left corner, and then just type in Control Panel. There it is popping up right now. And then you want to go Programs, Uninstall a Program. And this is just basically Windows' way of removing software. Some Most software does come with uninstalls themselves, but this is the more thorough way of doing it. And so we're going to look up Registax. And as you can see, we have Registax and we have the update. So we're going to remove it backwards from the way we installed it. So we'll remove the update first. Click it. Uninstall. OK. OK. And then we'll remove the actual program. Click it. Uninstall. Oh, I removed the whole thing. There we go. The next software is pip. Again, click it. Uninstall. Are you sure you want to do this? Yes. There we go. And then as for auto stacker, you won't find it in here. And that's because Auto Stacker is a standalone program. It runs basically out of the file. You can actually run this off a little disk that you can plug into your computer. 
So to remove it, you need to go to the actual place where we saved it or extracted the file. So if you don't remember that, you can right click on your shortcut and go open file location and it takes you right to it. And here we are, it takes you to the actual program where I saved it in my Astro Programs folder. So it's just a matter of right click, move to trash or delete, sorry. And then these dead pixels in the EULA is actually part of that as well. So you can just send those to the trash tool as well. And then, yeah, that should be about it. This is the rest of the programs. And then all you have to do is empty re recycle bin. Yes. And there we go. So now if I try to open up auto stacker from the shortcut, it's going to say it's gone, basically. So delete the shortcut, yes. There we go. All cleaned up and removed. Normally after you uh, uninstall or even install software, it's always good to restart your computer. So I'm just going to go ahead and do that, and we will continue on to the next chapter. We should have some lunar data here to be able to process and run through these programs. I'm just going to quickly explain how these programs work. PIP is pretty much preparing our software to go through either of these programs. It will crop off the black areas on your photo so you're not having to try to process a bunch of black. and. Uh, it turns photo to video. It also will take your photos and spit them out as photos. It does so much. It's actually a very powerful program. So it's going to prepare all of our moon images into a nice AVI, which is an auto video file. And uh, then we can run it through AutoStacker. And uh, it'll spit out a nice image ready to be sharpened up in Photoshop. Or we can run it through Registax and it'll spit out a sharpened image just Registax has extra settings where you can play with sharpening, brightness, contrast. On the downside though, you're limited to about 2 gig gigabytes file size for an AVI. You can use this program and spit it out as images and then run like 300 images through Registax and it works it just fine. It just it doesn't like the AVI files above 2 gigabytes. So there's more than one way of actually developing your photos so to say and uh, it's just a matter of finding out a workflow I would suggest converting them into video using pip run it through auto stacker to do the stacking and then you take your final image and you can put it through Registax and still use those sharpening and brightness and contrast settings in there unless you have Photoshop then just eliminate Registax because like personally I hate Registax. It's I've just put pushed my computer through the wall. It's just it freezes up all the time and you wait for hours and it's just uh but at the same time it does have a nice sharpening technique to it and a lot of people like it. I personally can get the same results using Photoshop. So but I am gonna show how to use it just because it's free software and uh some people like it. So but to begin with we're gonna go with PIP and open this up and so this program is going to take all of our images so we got this first night here I got all these images of the moon I think it's like 75 or 73 files so it took those 73 files aligned them took off all the black area and it converted it to a video here and so now we can run this video through either program being only 57 files, see how it's 823 megabytes, so Registax will be able to run this no problem. So to do this, we open up PIP and we'll go add image files. So I've already done this night, I will go on to the other night I had here, Christmas night apparently, and I'll select all these full moon images. As you can see, there's way more, and there's a good chance Registack won't be able to read this. I didn't select all of them. 
Okay, select the last one, shift click, select the first one, there we go, selected them all. And we'll just go open. And it's going to give you a warning that it's set into join mode. And uh, just because they're all one image file loaded. So just agree with that. And that just means it's set up the join mode here. Batch mode is for if you have a bunch of images in one object, a bunch of images of another object, you can do it as that way. And so it'll pop up a preview once your images are loaded. And this is just a preview of what you're going to get if you just go with the settings that are all set up right now. So you can go down here and go optimize for. And if you know what you're doing, then uh, like let's say I knew I was doing aligning images of the International Space Station. So I could use this setting and it'll automatically set all my images to create a video. And uh, it is actually possible to do this with an SLR and a uh, camera or a telephoto lens. Actually, I got a video on my channel that I did using the same setup that I'm doing right now with the moon. I did the space station. So we're not going to go with any of these. I've already, we're going to be going through each file anyways and doing our own. And we'll save our settings for future times when we want to come in and process moon images. So you got your bottom four tabs here image files, dark files, flat files, and flat dark files. These are basically calibration frames, these three ones, the dark flat, the flat, and the darks. And this is basically to remove noise in your image and uh, to remove dust halos in any of the overexposed areas. It's mainly for deep sky imaging. You can use it with planetary if your camera is really that dirty, but I've never felt the need to so we can just ignore these bottom tabs except for the one that says image files got 156 frames of the full moon here that we'll go through so we'll go to the next tab input options we want binning disabled that just pretty much means when you bin you cut down to half the size but you increase your resolution so we'll just leave that disabled we're not going to do any of that uh, enable raw image hot pixel fixer I'm going to go with that I shoot raw, I might as well use the advantages of with raw. Debayer raw image files. That's basically put color back into the raw image files because a raw file is unprocessed and uh, there's no color assigned to it yet. So we want that. We don't really need to extract the tater data time. Uh, we're not decoding an ABI file, so we don't need this. If we were taking an ABI file and uh, trying to decode it and get the images you check check this and if it's an older AVI file is the only reason you'd want to use it I don't think anybody will ever use this really uh, as sur file header we're not using sur files input frame range so if you want to pick a frame range of your video and spit it out we don't need any of that don't need to drop frames and color debayer we shot in raw. If you shot in color, it should already be colored anyways with your SLR, so don't need to worry about any of that. Next tab, processing options. So we'll just add gain and gamma, just leave that. If you want to adjust it a bit, you can. You basically play with the settings and then click test options. So I'll click here, like enable noise median filter. And then I'm going to go here, convert color to monochrome. No, I don't want to do that, but I do here want to stretch my histogram white point to 75 percent and set my black point to zero so that's going to make this zero and then the brightest pixel on the moon here is going to be about 75 percent of our histogram so with those checked if I want to see how it actually turned out I can just click test options it'll run it through it's usually a little bit quicker and there we go. Now it's actually a little bit more processed and uh, got color assigned to it. You can't really tell because, well, it's the moon. And keep in mind, this is just a single frame. So uh, reject frames with overexposed pixels. I wouldn't worry about this as long as you shot all with the same settings. You should be all right. If you used your SLR attached to a telescope, you may want to use one of these options to orientate it right. You flip it and rotate it. So frame stabilization mode, and this is where we want to align all of our frames and everything. So we'll go object planetary, enable the cropping, 
or sorry, enable object detection is what we want. And then uh, just go with the defaults and then the auto detection thre threshold. It should be fine just on auto. And if you want to test it, you click this, test detect threshold. And it'll give you a preview of what it's going to see as the object and what it's going to see as not the object in order to align all your frames. So you want your object to be nice solid red like that. If it is a little bit off, you'll have uh, gray spots in here, and you don't want that. You want a nice solid red object. That way it knows that's the moon. We're going to align all these to that. And then, yes, we want to center the object in each frame. If you shot the moon with the shadow in the left or the right, you can actually tell it right here, and that it'll actually uh, compensate and center it that way or you can actually just adjust your X or Y offset to adjust for your uh, if it's not center so I want to crop it definitely because there's way too many black pixels around that so with my SLR which was a T4i 2000 by 2000 pixels uh, seems to work for me that was at 600 mil focal length and then we'll, we'll go test options and it'll give us a preview to see how our cropping looks now. Looks pretty good to me. I like that. So yeah, if I wanted to move it up or down, left or right, your X will adjust it left or right, your Y is up and down. So quality options, this is what the other two programs are going to do, so we don't really need to use this. Animation options, we want to play them all in forward frame. And don't want to do any of this. This is for if you're doing a GIF image. You can set it to play forward and go back or keep repeating and stuff like that. So we just want to play all in forward frames. Output options, we want it output as an AVI. If you're, say, having issues with Registax and it's not reading the AVI, this is where you can just click it and go with TIFF, and it'll spit out a bunch of TIFF images. But we'll go with AVI. And actually, now I think of it, I think I did do or that one. Yeah, so this one here, I was having issues with Registax reading these files, 325 frames, so it was well over 2 gigabytes, it was like 4 gigabytes. And so I ran it out as a TIFF image, and then it made it a folder here, and then here's all my crop moon images, all pre-aligned, and then I can run those through Registax instead of the video. The whole reason I go with video is it's just a much cleaner way it's one file to deal with and you just don't have to clutter your hard drive pretty much like that whereas we got just a single file here so anyways continuing on <laughs> so yeah we wanted to set up as an AVI uh, just go with the defaults here that way it puts the folder in with your images if you want to split your color channels you can click this checkbox here don't really want to do that as for your file options, if you hover over it, if you hover over anything in this program, actually, it tells you what the setting is and what it does. And uh, for the most part, we want to use the DIB RAW uncompressed. And then uh, with Registax, you may want to generate an old format AVI, and then you limit it down to two gigabytes and then it'll process two gigabytes worth and then start a new file of if you still have more images and you can actually process two different files of the same moon up to two gigabytes and then stack those two stacked images to get your 400 together seems like a hassle where it's just easier to run it through auto stacker I've never had an issue with that program so uh, yeah we'll go with Jenner no, I don't want to generate the old format API because you actually you lose data in it too. So we'll go with leaving it off. If Registax don't like it, then I can show how to go with uh, Auto Stacker. Um, use frame rate 60, 30, whatever floats your boat. I'll go with 30. 
and then generate WinGPOS compatible file formats. Don't worry about this. This is actually for this software here for doing Jupyter images. Uh, it just needs it to be able to read your images, it extracts date and time for aligning. So just leave it unchecked. And then uh, we'll click test options one last time. <clears throat> Excuse me. And everything looks good here. And then we can go do processing. And 0 of 156, ready, and start. So it actually does go through pretty quick depending on how many files you have. But I'm still going to pause the video. It may be slow with the uh, screen capture going. So magic of time, let's make this go faster. And poof, we're done. So after uh, pip is all finished, it'll actually open up your window, your navigator window to the file where it is, which is right in our image files. So here's our video. Go ahead and click it, check on it. It wasn't the greatest out that day as you can see. There's some clouds that actually kind of went in front like a haze. But there's a few sharp frames in there and this is why we got to take a bunch of images is just to get those few lucky sharp ones that we get. So now that pip's all done with that what we can do is you go options and then you can go save options and in here I've already uh, made one but I'll make an I'll just save over it type in a file name so I called this pip moon settings and I saved it in with my image files and went save and yes I want to replace it so then now anytime I open up pip and I want to do moon images I just basically go options load options and I can go into here load this file go open everything's been automatically set and it's all saved so it's all set the crop at the 2000 by 2000 if you had to do an offset it will save that as well just be forewarned of that so if I wanted to do another image file you must remove these ones first so remove all image files and now I can add some fresh ones <laughs> If you could just go add image files, it'll add more images to that file. So that was the 25th. We'll go on to yeah, the 29th. I did a bunch of images, and we'll actually just go ahead and leave it like that. And then the 30th, I also did images. By yeah, I'm actually going to make this into an AVI file just because I want to actually run it through uh, auto stacker instead so select first image select the last image open it'll say processing and then you wait and it's gonna give you a preview and because everything's been preset there we go and as you can already see, since it was shaded here, it's actually sitting up a little too high. So I can go into my options here and do an offset in the Y of uh, 50 pixels. I'll try that. And that looks better do processing start processing okay so we'll let it do that so on to the next video we're gonna go through Registax and I'll just show you how you can run a smaller file through it or image files and then uh, after that we'll do auto stacker and we should be done Okay, so let's quickly go through Registax now. Boot up the program.
All right, with Registax, it's actually fairly simple. It'll actually give you a green icon onto the next button that you need to press, and you can just follow the defaults. I will explain as much as I know about the program. I don't know everything, but all I do know is it likes to crash. It pisses me off, but I will still use it once in a while. So here we go. We select our files and go to where our stuff is saved. So we'll try out this small video file first. The fact that it just loaded it right there tells me that it should be able to process it. If it crashed on you right there then it's not going to be able to handle the video file. So There we go. It's loaded in here. It's showing that there's 72 frames and we're on frame 1. So you got this little scrubber down here and you can actually scrub through your video and it's usually best to scrub through it and just find a half ass decent frame and now we'll use that to set up our alignment points on so I'll go with frame 5 so we'll go with the default area this is where you're gonna need to adjust it if you shot during the day and it's uh, all lit up here it's gonna try to align that stuff so you can I'll just show you here I'll set up my alignment points And then these are all my alignment points that Registax is going to use to align all the images with. And it also uses it to determine the quality of the image. So if you notice that your alignment points are out in the dark area or gray area if you shot during the day, you can adjust it here on this slider. You can reduce the amount of alignment points and it will take it off that area usually first. And I'll go back to my 540. Sure. If you ever want to add in your own alignments, you can actually do that and you just click on it. And then you can say you didn't want that alignment point there, right click on it, it takes it back off. So if I were doing like a solar image for my solar prominence images, I actually will use Registax and manually align off of each little filament of the sun in order to align those proms. You can also adjust where it's going to look like a 3x3 three three pixel area or a low pixel value. Like I said, default is all good. And then you can also go scan frames. It does a quick 5 point alignment and picks the best frame to use for alignment. It's up to you if you want to use it. It's not a must, but I find it tended to crash any time I tried it, especially with larger files, so I just avoided it. And then see the green line here is our next button that we want to click, obviously. So we'll click align. Now this is a small file. It should go through it pretty quick. Plus using the uh, PIP software, we've already pre-aligned our stuff. It hasn't been precisionly aligned, but it's, it's very close and it helps Registax actually figure out which is what pixel and try to align each of them. So with Registax you can't really scroll and zoom in and out. You basically have what you see and then you drag your slider bars. If you want to see the full disk image we'll select this little checkbox up here after it's done doing its stuff. This is the progress bar down here you always want to watch that. If it's not moving chances are the program froze up. <laughs> so let's let it go through. So yeah full image there it is. So if you want to zoom in, just uncheck that and then you can move your sliders around. Let's see the full image, there you go. So these are each of our images. This line here is showing the uh, quality of each of the image and then the up and down is the difference of each image. So as you can see the quality dips pretty bad here. So this is where we want to limit to how many frames that we're going to use. And this is where we waste all of our precious DSLR <laughs> images and start throwing them out, throwing out the bad ones. So you can limit it by lowest quality, best percentage of frames, best frame alignment points, or just best frames. I'll go with best percentage of frames. And then as you adjust it, you can see this slider here goes left and right. So I'll bring it down, I'm only going to go with 50% of those frames. So out of the 72 frames, we are going to go 
37 I believe it is so we'll click limit because it's our next one to be clicking the green icon and then here you'll see these little lines it's basically showing how much it's going to have to shift between those alignment points to align things uh, a little bit is alright if you see a lot then there's something seriously wrong in your image like it, the camera got bumped or something so this is why you want to try to keep them relatively similar and close when you're taking your images. You don't want any rotation whatsoever. So you're limited to time there if you're on a tripod because the moon will rotate as it goes across the sky. So we will go show stack graph. So this is where we can refine it a bit more. It's looking at our graph of the 47 frames now and it's been cropped down in stack size to 36 and we can actually bring down and limit off the better quality frames so this one frame down here is actually the best quality frame but we're just gonna bring it down 28 let's go 25 so we're only stacking 25 pictures in here and then we will go stack Again, it's small file. It should go through this pretty quick. Larger the file, you're just you walk away. If you see no progress within 10 minutes, then yeah, you got a frozen up program and you got to restart it. And this is why I don't like this program. <laughs> so if you ever do have to deal with Registax crashing, go to your taskbar, right click. And then you can go uh, task manager or you can search it in your start bar it's in the control panel and then yeah you just find the program and hopefully look at that it says it's not responding and it froze up so you click that and then you would go in task I'm gonna give it a chance though because it shouldn't have froze up it's a very small file sometimes it does say it's not responding when it's doing the stacking so if you click stack and then try to click it again it's going to show not responding but it's just it's using up the CPU it's really memory intensive on your computers I'm just gonna pause the video here <laughs> okay so it's all done 100 percent I actually ended up having to restart it and go through everything again um, another thing to note Registax does not like it when you do other things while it's trying to run <laughs> so just the fact that I was showing you how to restart Registax is what caused it to crash it's a very finicky program but right away is where I'm going to show you this program does excel so it has gone through it's stacked our images we can close this window. You can close it by either hitting the X or ticking this checkbox. So here's our stacked final image. It looks much better than a single frame, but you still see it's kind of blurred out. And that's just because there's so much data in this image now that we need to actually work out the sharpness on this image. So after it's done, you'll think that you got to click stack again. Don't you can save this image and export it to uh, Photoshop so like if we were to just go save image and I'm gonna save it as a TIFF and we'll just save it as the same file so now I can show you later on we'll play with this in Photoshop or if you don't have Photoshop you go to this final tab here called wavelets so this TIFF image, you can bring it back into Registax anytime, and it's going to take you to this Wavelets window here directly. When it's only one image, it knows that you want to process it. So here's all your functions you can do. Stretch your histogram, play with your gamma, your color mixing, you adjust your view stack size. I don't know what the hell you use that for. <laughs> Yeah, color balance, that's also color balance, flip and rotate, resize, denoise, wavelet, filter, crop it, mask it, brightness, contrast. But uh, wavelets is pretty much the sharpening technique that Registax will use. So if you click on the preview window, 
it shows you red in uh, like this ugly mesh here and uh, wherever you click it is only going to work on this small square area of the image while you do your sharpening so uh, you pick the area that you want to work on and I'm going to use this area down here and we'll get rid of the show full image so we can actually be zoomed in a bit more and uh, if you want to zoom in a lot more go view zoomed and it'll give you a window we're zooming in on so if you hold control you can actually set it up to what you want to use to check your contrast with so I'll go with that and there we go and you can adjust how much you want to zoom in and the type of sharpening that you want to use B spline is usually the best one I found so we go into our wavelets and when you hold the preview red decreases green increases says right across the top when layer is enhanced so when I increase the slider the red's going to go down the green's going to come up is what it's showing for the contrast so you just adjust your slider and you can start to see the contrast and the sharpness come out and then uh, you got your two options here you can denoise just this strict layer of sharpening so this is how Registack works is it sharpens in different depths and then you can also do your sharpening and uh, these six wavelets it's pretty much you play with it and adjust it to your taste and to what you think looks good and you can really really go overboard with this and I'll just show you here just dial up everything like look at that contrast we're pulling out of the moon it, it, when you do increase your contrast though you're increasing noise so don't overdo your moon images like this honestly it drives me crazy when people do this uh, with astrophotography I found less is more so we'll just reset our wavelets here that's one way of doing your sharpening with this program if you're like me and don't like sticking around with a bunch of different settings you can go used wink <laughs> linked wavelets <laughs> And uh, you got to make sure you clicked on Gaussian first. So Gaussian, use linked wavelets. And so now these first two wave, well, every wavelet is linked together. But it's uh, a lot more touchy. And all I'll do if I am using this software is I'll go use linked and I'll just use the first two. So stretch that up a bit. Bring the underneath up a bit. And again, you can preview what you're working with. And then I'm going to pull out some of the noise. So let's say we want to go with that. Maybe adjust our brightness and contrast a bit. That might be too much for the lit up area, maybe overexposed. Alright, so once you have that, we'll go show full image. So yeah, this is what it's going to look like when we're processed. So we just click do all, and now it's going to run through and render the image with all this settings that we gave it. So just let it run through. You can actually watch your progress bar down here. And you can actually see it scan across the image. And just like that, we got a nice, crisp, sharp moon image. She's a little noisy. So there we go it's fully rendered there now it's fully rendered so once it's done the do all now you can go save image and save your image and you have a nice no 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 don't overwrite uh, no let's go save image 
It's the same image, but it's sharp. We'll call it wavelet. Save. So yeah, if you don't like that and you want to, say, change something on it, like reduce the amount of noise that we have in here. So, dial up the noise, or the denoise, I should call it. And it'll start all over. And you'll have to re-click the do all. And that actually looks better. So that's about it with Registax. You can do your images like this. Adjust your coloring, your brightness, your contrast, play with your wavelets. And uh, that's about all there is to it. Just let this finish and I'll give a quick preview of the three images that we did do with this. Sorry for making a sit through this. I'd pause the video, but for what it's worth, it's going through pretty quick. So this is a stack of a whole 25 images out of 72, I think it was, or 73 that we took. So we'll go save image now that it's done. We'll call it the wavelet 2 and save. And then show you zoomed in here. So yeah, there's 20 images stacked. That's 20 out of 72. And that's how you get your nice contrasty moon shots. With nothing but an SLR. So just take a quick look at all these images. So here's our three images. We'll go preview. And one to one size. So this is the image, the last one that we did, the wavelet 2. This one here is without any wavelets or sharpening done on it. But you can still take this into Photoshop and get a nice sharpen out of it. And then this was the wavelet with way too much noise in it, so I actually did have to bring down that noise. Alright. So, let's say you're having issues with reg stacks. Oops, I'm opening up another reg stacks. It does not like that. <laughs> Close you. There we go. Come back. So now that that's all done, let's say we're having issues with it and we want to do a stack of photos instead. So to do the stack of photos, which one did, was it? This one? Yeah. We'll go into our stack photo, but down here for file types, change it to TIFF, unless you saved it as BMP or a FIT. TIFF. Select the first one. Shift click, select the last one, open. Now I had this as an AVI file. I couldn't even get it to open. It would just not even read how many frames were in it. And I even tried to reduce it. And So like I said, Registax, it sucks when you have a lot of images. You have to do it as a bunch of image files. Uh, stretch intensity levels. Let's go no. We already did that in PIP. And there we go. And it's all the same thing. Scrub through, find a nice sharp image. I really don't think that graph is right. It might be. Oh, do you see that? There's a little bit of rotation in my image, so I am going to have some issues with this. But we'll set our alignment points. and align. And it's going to go through and align the images. And it's pretty much all the same stuff. I'm not going to make you watch through all this again, but I just wanted to show you that you can do it with video. You can, if you're having issues with video, then just save it as a bunch of images and run them through like this. And 
it does it the same thing it's all the same issues and it'll do your final wavelet image as a tiff file so next video i'm going to run through auto stacker it's a way better program and i'll also show you how you can take that file from auto stacker and bring it right here in registax Okay, on to the final program, Auto Stacker. Save the best for last. There's a few different versions of Auto Stacker. This is the most up to date one. If you followed along downloading, you should have the most up to date one. So it's as simple as one, two, three. There's a number one here, you click that. Number two here, you click that. Number three here, you click that. There is a few little steps in the middle, but it's basically how it runs. So we'll go open select our video. I'm using the one of the Christmas full moon. So open that up. Over here is basically our display panel. We can zoom out so we can see the full moon here. At least most of it. And then you click uh, your image stabilization, how you want it to be able to stabilize our images here. Um, Pip has already done this for us, but it still runs this through and it does it a little bit more accurate. So you go plan it if it's something that's small like Jupiter or Saturn and you can just set your line points manually. Surface is more for if you're zoomed in looking for a lot of detail. So I use this for solar data all the time. Um, I'm going to go with surface as well because we have a lot of surface detail here that we're going to try to align. So you can uh, hold control and you click the stabilization point. We're right in the middle. Just leave it in the middle. Improve tracking. As you can see, you hover over it. tells you exactly what each does. Slower but sometimes more accurate for jumpy recordings. So some of these recordings I did do were kind of jumpy. So I will leave it with improved tracking. Expand and crop basically means when you stack see like we got 156 image, images here of stacking and when it stacks and overlines the images you get something like the corner of these two windows here how this one overlays and there's nothing underneath it so what it's going to do is pretty much oops crop the area out so you don't have any of that overlay so I usually go with uh, cropped quality estimator gradient noise robust three I leave this alone pretty much. Uh, your alignment points, local or global. Local means it's going to align everything around that little area of the alignment points, whereas global it's aligning the full image. So we'll just leave that at local. And then uh, you can load your last stack of frames and use that as a reference frames, but mm, I've never felt the need to do it. I should try it sometime, but <laughs> anyways, we'll just continue on. Click two, and now it's going to go through the frames and analyze them and tell me which ones are good and which ones are crap, and and it'll give you a bar graph to look at, and then you determine the percentage that you want to use, the percentage of frames you want to use. So I'll just let this run through. It usually goes through pretty quick. The next step, it's going to take a while, and I will pause the video for that. And here we go. Yeah, by the way, if you do have multi-core processing, it does it up here. You can adjust it up in this top corner. And it goes through each of these so it's going to do a surface image stabilization so it's going to stabilize it the best it can buffering basically buffering it's saving memory of it and getting ready to do your reference image and then it does the aligning image stacking map analysis but it's only going to go through these first two first it should <laughs> and there we go done. So here's our quality graph. It's quality frames, frame difference. 
And then, uh, so by looking at this, you want to, this is where I find it a little bit harder. I wish it was a lot like Registax here, where it could actually straighten out the frames. But even if you hover over it, after analysis, the graph shows the quality of the frames. Green line, come on, green line is in order. So we basically only want 50% of our frames according to this graph. Like We have a lot of different frames, but it does a really good job at aligning them. So the green line is the quality of the graph. We want 50% of them. So we can go through numbers of frames to stack or percentage of frames to stack. It's up to you. I'll go with percentage, just because this is what we're measuring by. Oh, damn it. So we'll go 50%. And the reason why there's four windows here and four windows here is you can say, spit me out an image of 10%, another one of 20, another one of 30, and another one of 40. And same with the numbers. Spit me out an image of one with 10 stack, one with 20 stack, one with 30 stack, one with 40 stack. And it'll do four separate images for you. We want them to come out as a TIFF image. You can change it if you're using a different program, whatever, but TIFF is usually the best one. Click this box and it'll uh, give you a sharpened preview, or sharpened image as well. And then you can blend your raw image in to that uh, sharpened image just to give it more of a smoother kind of look. So we can go ahead with that. Uh, I myself don't really want a sharpened image out of auto stacker I'll do it later on but either way it's going to give you one of those images uh, RGB align uh, no need to do that we did that in pip and then save in folders and then so after everything looks good here we go over here pick your alignment point size I try to go with a very small alignment point and then just say place alignment points in grid And just give it a sec here. So up here we have 5,395 alignment points on the surface of this for it to have to align. If you find that's too much for your computer to even handle, you can go clear. We can change our alignment point size. You can even go up to, let's go with the largest one, then we can go place alignment points in grid. and it'll probably get through this a much quicker but you won't have as sharp of an image and you can even go with a layer of 25 and a layer of 100 like this alignment point size but uh, actually we'll go with 50 on this one and by the way you can also manually put your alignment points just like Registax and if you don't want them you right click so it's just click to place them right click to remove them so we'll go 50, place alignment points in grid, gives us 1,358 alignment points. That sounds good to me. Everything looks good here, and just click stack. Everything seems good. So it's going to run through everything, and uh, I'll pause the video, and we'll do some time travel here and go to the next step. <laughs> Okay, and we're done. That didn't really take too long, maybe five minutes. I had enough time to go grab another coffee. So, um, one thing to note, AutoStacker will give the illusion that it is frozen up and it'll say not responding. But it is actually still working. Like, just before this finished, it even did that to me. It showed, like, it was frozen up and I just gave it a little bit and it came back. So when it's all done, it'll actually say done right there in front of you <laughs> and uh, so we'll go into our images and see how it turned out so this was December 25th this is our pit folder and then auto stacker will designate a folder for every stack size so if I change those four windows so if this was 10 let's go 20 30 40 and 50 then there would be a folder in here that says ASP 20, ASP 30, 
So we just went with 50. And then we'll preview these. One image is going to be done without any sharpening, and the other one is going to be with sharpening. This one is obviously done with the sharpening. So we'll go one to one size. And that's what we get. Keep in mind, a full moon it is really difficult to get any contrast off it just because there's no shade there when it's a full moon. And then, fortunately, a lot of people like to photograph the moon when it's full, and it's the worst time to do it. But uh, it is nice to have a full moon image. It uh, has its advantages. For instance, if I were to have shot a crescent moon a few nights ago, I can take this full moon, blend it in, and use it as the shadow instead, like using Photoshop, and make this look like the shaded area. So, and then this is our other image. Hasn't been sharpened or anything. It's just a straight out stack of 50% of 152 images. So. so then you would take this image and you take it into Photoshop and do your final processing. Or we can go like this. I know you're wondering, Registax? But if you're having issues with Registax actually stacking your images, use Auto Stacker to do the stacking part. And then we can go into here, select our image that Auto Stacker had made for us. This way we're getting the best of both worlds. And I believe it was that one. And we'll bring it into here. And it should automatically, we'll say no to that stretch intensity levels, it'll automatically take us to the wavelet area because it knows it's one image, it's already done, it's already been stacked. Okay, it wasn't quite, oh yeah, here we go. <laughs> and just like that, now we have the advantage of using wavelets still. And uh, so the area I'm going to use it's going to be over here because there's still a little bit of shade and we got some contrast on that. And I'm going to shut down Auto Stacker just so Registax can run a little bit smoother. <laughs> All right, and then we'll go use linked wavelets. This way we only have two sliders to have to deal with. And just slowly play with them, bring them up. Let's try to do this quickly. It may look like crap still, but. <laughs> Denoise it a bit. Yeah, you could spend hours playing with these wavelets and trying to perfect your sharpening. This is what I don't like about it, is it just takes too long. <laughs> Photoshop, it just does it globally, right away. Sure, we'll go with that. Go show full image. And again, we can adjust our brightness and contrast down here as well. And we'll go with that. Just give it a bit more contrast. I didn't move it at all. And then we'll go do all. And there we go. So as you can see, you can use the two programs together. I know Registax is a pain in the ass. It likes to freeze up in that. So that's where you can use Auto Stacker to do that work that Registax can't do, and then take that image that you get from Auto Stacker and use the sharpening algorithm of Registax. A lot of people like it just because of these wavelets and uh, the ability to do this in the program. I really wish the two makers would get together and do one nice, real simple, easy to use, self explanatory program. But. And there we go. That is probably one of the sharper full moon images you will find done with a DSLR. 
Um, if I had my telescope and did this, yeah, it would look way better. And then you can find it on my Google page, all my moon images. So there we go. We go save image. We'll save it in here and we'll call it AS uh, and reg. Let's go with that. Oh, shit. Should take all that off. Okay. Save. So we'll compare the three together now. And there you have it. Unsharpened through Auto Stacker. Sharpened through Auto Stacker. You see how there was really not much control for the sharpening. You blend a raw image in with it. And then we have the sharpened with Registax. It actually looks a little bit more smooth, more realistic. It maybe should have turned that brightness back down. <laughs> but uh, other than that, it does. It looks good. So. So there you have it. Hopefully this made sense and hopefully you learned something. Um, I am going to do another tutorial of how I do the final work in Photoshop. I will make it as a separate video though because this one took way too long. <laughs> so thanks for watching and if you want subscribe, uh, I really don't care as long as you watched it and learned something and feel free to share this video. So, thanks again and goodbye.